Hello and welcome. My name is Lauren Gilbert. I am the Senior Manager for Public Services here at the Center for Jewish History. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank the American Jewish Historical Society for co-sponsoring today's event with us. If you joined early, you saw a slideshow of some upcoming events. So if you'd like to sign up for programs or get more information uh, for the center or our partner organizations, uh, please visit the calendar link at the top of our webpage, which is cjh.org. And we can also drop a link to the calendar in the chat. Uh, just one announcement before we begin. We are currently running our summer reading schmooze, which is where you submit your Jewish themed summer reading recommendations to the center community. And we might share your recommendations on social media and our email newsletter. And once a month at our author events, we announce the winner of some CJH swag. And this month's winner is Raphael Lazar. And he recommended a book called The Dairy Restaurant by Ben Catcher. Um, I'm just gonna read you his very short review. Uh, this is a delightful, whimsical, well-researched, and as you'd expect from the author, illustrated history of Jewish dining out. For those of us lucky to have enjoyed the milchic pleasures of NYC's many dairy establishments until their disappearance, this book is an informative revelation. For the rest, you'll get a glimpse of what you've missed. What's not Jewish about this book? Es gesund. So thank you, Raphael. Uh, for the great review. Uh, and for any of you interested in participating, we will put the link for the summer reading schmooze also in the chat. Oh, and the chat is disabled for participants. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. We will get to as many of them as we can at the end, but you can type them in as we go along. Uh, the plan for today is that we will look at a few photographs of Eve Adams, uh, Jonathan will give a talk and we'll have a brief conversation and then we will open it up to the audience Q&A. Uh, we should be all wrapped up within one hour. Uh, the program is being recorded and will be available on the center's webpage and YouTube page within a couple of weeks. All right, so let me introduce Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Ned Katz is an independent scholar, historian, public intellectual and activist who focuses on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and heterosexual U.S. history, as well as a visual artist. Katz is a pioneering, innovative historian whose books have helped to create the field of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender history and sexual and gender history. His publications have received the highest scholarly accolades, and he has taught a sexual history class and organized a historical exhibit at Yale, presented a keynote address at Harvard, and headed a faculty seminar at Princeton. In 2004, Katz returned to visual art, a talent of his youth. In 2013, the first solo show of Jonathan Ned Katz's art opened at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art in New York, curated by the noted art historian, Jonathan David Katz, no relation. Uh, welcome Jonathan, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, we decided to show some pictures of Eve Adams first, right. so people would see uh, visually who I'm talking about. That is Eve in the middle, wearing <clears throat> in 1925, when she returned to Poland from the United States to uh, visit her family, and she's wearing a pants suit, an Oxford's white Oxford, and notice the contrast with the way her sister is dressed. And it's also her brother on uh, the left side. Next slide. That's Eve in passport photo taken in 1941. And it's my favorite picture of Eve. Uh, she looks like one of my contemporary pals, you know? Um, she's dressed in casual clothes that could be clothes from now. And um, it, she looks like a really great person to me. Next. Oh, that's an ad that Eve put in a radical newspaper when she was selling radical periodicals and she wanted people to notice her so she'd get sales. She will, you will know her by her hair and her hair is parted and looks exactly like it does in the 1925 uh, photo of her. Next. That's uh, where 
Eve's hangout was in New York City in uh, around 1940. It was in the basement there. You can see the window of the basement. It's 129 McDougal Street, and we'll, I'll talk more about it later. Eve's hangout. Next. Eve's passport photo from 1929. Uh, a, it's a Polish passport, and I love seeing her signature written so boldly. Uh, that's the way she signed Eve and uh, her her, uh, her other her other versions of her name. Next, a wonderfully uh, affectionate uh, cartoon or a, a portrait of Eve in that appeared in a. Uh, uh, English uh, in, in an American newspaper in, in Paris that was in English. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, I'll tell you more about that amazing column that appeared about Eve in Paris. Next. Eve in 1934, looking pretty tough, but I love it that she has a, a beret on her head. And um, it's, it's nice to see a different aspect of Eve. Next. Eve on the right and her uh, beloved companion, Hella Olstein, who I'll talk a little more about. Um, they were companions for and lived together for many years, about 13 years in France. Uh, next. Uh, Hella and uh, in the front and Eve on the left and an unknown couple on the on the in back. I will present an overview of Eve's uh, life and then we can have uh, a discussion about what interests people the most. On November 30, 1926 at Eve's a deportation hearing at the Women's Penitentiary on Welfare Island, now Roosevelt Island, Eve responded to the charge that she had published an indecent book. She said, I admit having written a book entitled Lesbian Love based on true acts and living characters of today the object of the book was to show the exact things that are happening from day to day. And every character is a true character and except she is given an assumed name. I believe the book is not in any way indecent, immoral or vulgar. There is not one word in the book that is vulgar. I can't see why I should be singled out and sentenced to imprisonment for writing my book, which was only meant to show the humorous side of life, the serious side of life and tragedy all in one. Born Chavaz Lotjever in 1891 into a Jewish family in Poland, Eve uh, uh, immigrated to the United States in 1912. In the US, the 21-year-old Eve befriended and worked with the famous anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman and got to know the larger-than-life Ben Lewis Reitman. In New York City, Eve worked in the garment industry in a sweatshop factory and uh, was a member of the progressive uh, Ladies Waste Makers Union. Those were makers of women's blouses. Uh, one of the lesbians profiled in Eve's book, Little Jimmy, may actually be Eve. Little Jimmy works in a ladies sweatshop uh, and goes on vacation to a hotel started by her union. I figured out that this resort was probably Unity House in Bushkill, Pennsylvania, initiated by radical 
Jewish women garment workers. These women argue to doubting male comrades that uh, working class solidarity would be improved if uh, they had uh, women and men had a place to dance together. Um, little Jimmy dances with a woman at the resort and this leads to a romantic and sexual encounter. In Eve's book, she talks a lot about gender issues. Eve's narrator says, little did Jimmy know of herself, little she knew of the masculine spark within her. All she did know was that she felt more comfortable in boyish clothes. She could run better, climb trees better, and feel unhampered in every action. But that masculine spark of a male-typed yearning to run, climb, pursue boys' activities, wear boys' clothes, and feel free is a repeated poignant theme in several early narratives of persons born female who rejected uh, restrictive feminine norms. Although uh, Jimmy is the only girl at the hotel who is enjoying this boyish freedom of of behavior and clothes. No one frowns on her clothes or activity, so she is, quote, perfectly at ease in this environment, this working class environment. Elsewhere, it seems, Jimmy's clothes and swagger have elicited criticism, and we'll see that Eve's uh, certainly did. After several years, Eve got tired of factory work, and by 1919, she had probably begun to sell radical periodicals as a way of making a living. And she, that, those periodicals included the Yiddish humor magazine, Der Große Kündes, literally the big stick, more expressively, the big prankster. Um, Eve had dinner one night with Jacob Marinoff, who was editor of The Prankster, The Big Prankster, and Jacob's sister, the actress, Fania Marinoff, was also at the dinner along with her husband, Carl Van Vechten. And Carl was mostly homosexual, but this marriage between Carl and Fania lasted 50 years with ups and downs, like many marriages, and uh, um, there's a book about, about them. So uh, at the time, Fania was then starring in a Greenwich Village theater in a play advocating free love. And Eve was clearly enchanted by the actress and wrote her a fervid fan letter, quote, I saw nothing else but your beautiful, dark, big eyes, which are hidden under those long, long eyelashes. Yet I saw your soul and it made me shiver and respect you so much more than an ordinary actor. You were not an actress, Miss Marinoff. You were a great artist and may be compared with the world greatest. Eve started making a living as a touring saleswoman of radical periodicals. And because of her association uh, with left radical causes and famous anarchists, Eve started to be surveilled by the Bureau of Investigation, the forerunner of the FBI. The young Justice Department employee, John Edgar Hoover, who we all have heard of, initiated as J. Edgar, initiated much of this surveillance of Eve because of what the Bureau called her radical activities, which were selling radical periodicals. Forget about uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, Anti-Jewish and anti-gender bending comments are blatant in the reports of bureau agents. Um, a Los Angeles agent commented on Eve's appearance, quote, Jewish type, hair cropped, complexion, that's her skin color, uh, medium, so she wasn't quite white, 
which is interesting. And he continues, not attractive, wears nose glasses. Uh, citizen informer Dr. Charles T. Bayliss walked into the San Francisco Bureau office to inform on Eve. Bayliss described Eve to the Justice Department, quote, she has short, fuzzy red hair, dresses mannishly, and is dirty, greasy, and Jewish in appearance, unquote. Bayless was touring the U.S. in 1919, presenting a speech titled Making a Better America. In one talk, Bayless advocated, deport the alien red, put the native-born traitor in jail, restrict immigration to desirable persons, and teach Americanism in the public schools. Around 1921-1922, Eve settled in Chicago with a beloved woman partner, Ruth Norlander, an artist. They opened a queer-friendly bohemian cafe called the Gray Cottage. They advertised it as Greenwich uh, Chicago's Greenwich Village Tea Room, which I love, Eve Adams and Ruth Norlander in charge. And I, I like that in charge too. It gave a, a signal, I think, that two women are in charge here and uh, other maybe same-sex couples are welcome. And it certainly became a bohemian hangout in the short time it, it existed. Poet Kenneth, Kenneth Rex Roth recalled the cottage as, quote, much the most bohemian of the bohemian tea rooms of the Chicago North Side. But one unhappy visitor to the cottage called it, quote, that refuge of thwarted intellect whose artistic atmosphere included one soiled menu card and one frowsy haired proprietress who borrows cigarettes. I, I think that might have been Eve because she did smoke. Numerous Chicago newspaper ads for the Gray Cottage refer to Eve's friend Ben Reitman as chairman of weekly talks. One talk was on vice and virtue in the village. Uh, that was advertised as a talk by Reitman with hot discussion. I would have liked to have been there for that talk. Another talk was on sensuality in American fiction. In 1925, Eve had split with Ruth Norlander and came back to New York City. There in Greenwich Village, in the basement of 129 McDougal Street, she opened another queer and bohemian friendly cafe, which is called Eve's Hangout. After Eve got in trouble, the entertainment industry trade paper Variety reported that shortly before launching her tea room, Eve had, quote, affected masculine attire and become a regular at the various resorts catering to temperamentals. That's a term for homosexuals from the time period. When Eve opened her tea room on McDougal Street, the paper that Variety alleged, she had given, quote, the tip off of what kind of joint it was through placarding the main entrance with a sign which read, men are admitted but not welcome. I think that that sign probably never existed. It's not mentioned in any other document. And uh, it suspiciously promotes uh, and repeats the stereotype of lesbians as man-haters. In 1925, Eve uh, uh, risked all to write and publish a book titled Lesbian Love. It briefly pictures about two dozen women amounting to, uh, I think, a pioneering lesbian community study. And that's uh, the community study of group portraits, uh, usually set in a particular place, but Eve's isn't isn't in one place. It's just a variety of women are portrayed, very different variety. 
One of the best sections of Eve's book is titled, How I Found Myself. And in this, an unnamed narrator describes her first sexual experience with a woman at the age of 19. The first person narrator suggests that two years uh, before Eve embarked for the U.S., she had experienced a, set, a sensual encounter that her narrator recalls as, quote, beautiful and as one of the most significant events of my life. Eve's surveillance by Bureau of Investigation agents and immigration offic officials led to Eve's arrest. Immigration officials, the New York City police, and a biased informer and a number of state employees were all out to get her. I have documented an actual conspiracy between a judge, parole officers, and immigration officials to deport Eve. Eve was convicted of publishing an obscene book. She was con also convicted of a second charge attempted sex with a police woman who had been sent in to entrap her. Adams was jailed for a year and a half and then deported. Eve lived and worked in Paris or in, in France mostly, in, in, <laughs> in Paris mostly, for 13 years selling what were considered dirty books in English that US and British tourists could not buy in their own countries. They came to Paris to get them and snuck them home in some way in their luggage and hoped they wouldn't be caught. Along with Fanny Hill, Eve sold books by James Joyce, Aeneas Nin, D.H. Lawrence, and Henry Miller, with whom she uh, became good friends. And, um, a lot of these books have now become uh, books that you read in Frenchman, freshman English classes in college. <laughs> Times have changed. Eve uh, was written up in uh, the New York uh, Tribune, uh, published in Paris, despite its name, in a column by an American journalist with the unusual name of Wombly Bold. Bold called Eve one of those few females who never criticizes another, other women. Bold then added, Eve had been, quote, asked to leave America because she wrote a harmless little book called Lesbian Love, unquote. He concluded with a prophecy, quote, one of these years, America won't act that way. And that brief, bold comment, those extraordinary words are the single defense of Eve's book published in her lifetime. Uh, they, I found them really amazing. And uh, Bold's brave words were accompanied by that affectionate caricature of Eve that I showed you earlier. Eve and her dear, close, live-with companion, Hella Olstein, were living in France when the Nazis invaded uh, Paris in 1940. And they and many others, Jews and anti-Nazis, moved uh, south to get away from the Nazis in the north. And so uh, Eve and Hella were in Nice, went to Nice mostly. They managed to evade trouble for three years, but were finally arrested and sent to Auschwitz and murdered. I was fortunate in the research process that Eve's brother, Yerak Mil, who immigrated to Israel, had a son, and that son had a son, Eren, Eran Zahavi. And very late in my research, Erin tried to find the family of Eve's companion, Hella Olstein. And sure enough, in uh, Erin found a lawyer in Switzerland, Daniel Olstein, whose father was Hella's brother. And sure enough, Daniel Olstein turned out to have an important 
file of letters from Hela and Eve and uh, pictures of them together and the a new passport photo of Eve. And it was amazing, amazing. I couldn't believe it, this last minute, wonderful find of documents, very important documents. Having e Hella's and Eve's letters to family members allowed me to communicate the tightening grip of the Nazis uh, in France and the two women's desperate hope to escape and their increasing uh, fear of capture as both of them being Jewish. After evading the Nazis for three years, as I said, both Hella and Eve were arrested and they were carried from France to Auschwitz in Poland on Nazi convoy 63, a trip of about three days in a cattle car that was loaded with people and little air and a potty, you know, and uh, it was horrible, really. Amazingly, Actually, three survivors of Convoy 63 and Auschwitz wrote memoirs detailing the horror of that Convoy 63 trip. And those uh, descriptions allowed me to convey the horror of Auschwitz itself, because I understand that as the Nazis retreated from Auschwitz at the end, towards the end of the war, um, they destroyed a lot of documentation of what was going on there. In summary, Eve Adams' life links diverse pasts, making her life directly relevant to present concerns. One, her publishing Lesbian Love makes her central to the history of sexuality, in particular to lesbian resistance history, two, repeated critical references to Eve's gender bending make her story central to historically changing norms of masculinity and femininity, three, Eve's story is central to the history of immigration, in particular uh, uh, to uh, the history of Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe in the early 20th century, and Eve's migrations from Poland to the US to France and her visits to Berlin, London, and Stockholm make her an international heroine. For Eve's life is embedded in modern Jewish history, of course, and her mode of death situates her in the history of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and, and genocide in general. Five, Eve's life represents a too rare example of working class history and working class organizing and left and union organizing for a fairer world. Six, Eve's uh, surveillance by the Bureau of Investigation and the repressive collusion of federal, state, and city officials, a judge and local police officers make her story relevant to the uh, history of repressive government responses to social justice movements. We're familiar with that. Seven, and lastly, the rise of fascism in Eve's time has eerie resemblances to our own time and can serve as an early warning signal. On the last page of my biography of Eve, I imagine seeing her way off in the distance, waving her arms frantically, trying to get our attention. And I first, I, I can't hear what she's saying. And then I do hear she's saying, don't mourn, organize. So that's my overview of Eve Adams' life today. And I look forward to comments and, and uh, questions. Thank you, Jonathan. How did you come to learn about Eve Adams? Well, I was reading uh, a, a book review in the New York Times in December 2016 of uh, about women who had been influential 
influential in New York City and infecting, infecting the city in, in different ways. And uh, Eve, a uh, Polish Jewish immigrant, uh, was uh, arrested for, it said, for uh, attacking a policewoman. And I said, who is this? Because I'm very familiar with LGBT history and have pioneered it. And, and, and I didn't remember a thing, uh, reading a thing about Eve earlier. So I started researching her and she got more and more interesting as I did the research. Uh, she became, you know, totally fascinating. I saw that first I thought it might be an article because, you know, I didn't think there'd be so much, but it there was turned out to be such fascinating documentation that I could write a book about Eve. Well, I know sometimes it can be hard uh, because a lot of this LGBTQ history is hidden or important de details are go unmentioned. So can you talk a little about the research that you did and what you were able to find? Yes, I just want to stress what a cooperative and lovely process it was. Uh, every turn I met uh, very gracious people and who were very generous in their help. Uh, but um, when I started looking on the internet, as everybody does, uh, to, to research Eve, um, I found that Barbara Kahn, a, a playwright had written three different versions of plays about uh, Eve's life with, and were based on research that she had done with a gay male archivist, uh, Stephen Siegel, who was an expert at this kind of research and, and he was a librarian and archivist. So, uh, and then, so Barbara had a lot of information at hand and she was very generous. You know, once I, shit, I, convinced her I was on the up and up and would do Eve justice because she, she really cared about Eve. And um, uh, Barbara, I believe, sent me to er Erkan Zahavi, whose grandfather was Eve's brother. In, er Erkan lives in Israel. And um, Erkan was very, very helpful uh, in the research process. And as I described in my talk, he reached out and found the Olstein family with this amazing file of new documents. And so he was, Iran was completely helpful. He came to New York recently and we celebrated the publication of Eve's biography at 129 McDougal Street <clears throat> in the basement. And it was a, a joyous, wonderful, moving event. That's great. Uh, and unlike most people at that time, she didn't really try to hide her sexual orientation, going so far as to write a book called Lesbian Love. So where do you think that that strength of character came from or, um, or in what, why she differed from many other lesbian figures at the time, even the union activists you talk about in the book who really separate the private and public spheres of their lives? Yes, I think that Eve was um, a working class person who always uh, had to work uh, hard for a living at uh, working class jobs like factory work, uh, or she picked up this new thing of selling uh, periodicals and touring around the country, uh, you know, left periodicals and union periodicals. And uh, so uh, she, um, um, I for, I'm sorry, I forgot, uh, we're talking about um, not hiding her orientation. Yes. yes, it was her. So it's her class that distinguish her from these more professional women who really felt they need to hide. They were more public in a way. They were public in a way, and they would have had big trouble if the fact was known that they were living with and had a romantic and often sexual relationship with another woman, which was true a number of these women union uh, leaders that I discuss in the book. So, so Eve was different in that respect. She had nothing to lose in a way that they did have. There, you know, you you could you could live with another woman in 1925, and as long as you didn't uh, assert the romantic sexual character of your relationship, you could you were 
consider you, oh, we have a roommate, you know, we have a, a companion, a friend who is living with you. So, it, you know, there wasn't this, uh, it's developed a consciousness about sexuality and heterosexuality and homosexuality. So it was a different world. So uh, to understand Eve, you really need to understand this very different historical context. Um, and she didn't sign a declaration of intention to become a US citizen until 1923, which was many years after her arrival and then never took further steps towards citizenship. Do you have any idea about why that was and could acting earlier have prevented her fate, do you think? Yes, it would have given her the civil rights of a, at least formally, the civil rights of a citizen as opposed, she remained an alien. They used that word about her, it's an ominous word. Um, it's a, yeah, really ominous word. Um, so yeah, she remained, uh, she never went through with the full citizenship process and she regretted it because she loved being in America. She was a patriot in defense of American ideals, I think. She experienced a freedom in the US that perhaps she didn't in Poland. She sort of experimented with different aspects of bohemian life. And yeah, she, she um, she had a, a way of dealing with things that um, that led her uh, to be different. Yes. Um, since we are the the center for Jewish history, can you talk a little bit more about the Jewish aspects of her story? Sure. Um, I had to do a lot of research on this to try to understand how such a bold woman could come out of this Poland, because I think we have a stereotype about the shtetl based on uh, the Broadway musical Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and it turns out that there was huge pro political ferment in Poland uh, in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, even in small towns and Eve's, the town Eve came from and um, Malau it was called. And, um, and so there was a feminist movement. Uh, there was uh, all, all, all varieties of Zionism. Some Zionists wanted to stay in Poland and, and uh, really improve the situation for Jews in Poland. Others wanted to immigrate to Palestine. Um, so there were, all, there were nationalists, there were liberals, all different political things going on, hot conversations. So I ended up with a very different idea of how Eve could have emerged from, from, from this uh, background. Um, yeah, she, and like she had a great facility with languages. And I was struck that uh, one historian tells us that W women in the smaller villages and cities often were encouraged to learn different languages in order to deal with the customers in uh, Eve's parents wrote, wrote, they uh, ran a grocery store of some kind. And so it would have been really uh, valuable if uh, Eve could speak to some of the different customers that came in who knew, spoke different languages, Polish and Russian and uh, uh, Yiddish, of course, and uh, other French, perhaps. Uh, yeah, so she, she was very good with languages. Um, you talk at, mostly at the end of the book about um, your own personal history and how learning of her fate affected you. And I thought that was a very touching part of the book. Do you mind talking a little bit about your own background in relationship to Eve's story? Yeah, um, well, I feel that I wouldn't be writing Eve's story and doing this lesbian history and gay male history and transgender history and bisexual history and heterosexual history if I hadn't been part of a resistance movement. Uh, my work began as a play that was put on by the Gay Activist Alliance. So I think that um, I feel a kinship with Eve 
who wrote a pioneering book in 1925. I wrote a, one of the early books on um, gay US history. And um, uh, I really identified with her uh, rebel spirit, her questioning the big picture, working for working people, um, mo which are most people are working people. Um, so I, in many ways, my politics coincided with her or hers. And um, it was uh, very exciting to do the detective work that uh, was required to discover this really quite forgotten person uh, in, in any detail. And there's, you know, I was very, I'm very uh, big on dis, dis, discussing uh, what might be factually based uh, by documents and what is, uh, you know, conjecture and also distinguishing that from mistaken uh, fact claims that are on the internet. There's lots of mistaken things said about Eve and wrong, there's, wrong pictures of her that aren't her and things like that I hope will maybe get corrected once the book is more widely distributed. I should say that everyone who registered for this talk should have gotten a link for a discounted copy of the book but we can in case you misplace the email we can pop that link again into the chat and I highly recommend it. Um, why don't we move on to some uh, audience questions um, this one's easy to answer. Is it possible to read lesbian love somehow? Well, it's in the book. <laughs> yes, yes, it's in the book. We were able, I was able to get hold of a copy. It may be the one copy that exists in the whole world by now. Um, there were 150 copies printed originally by Eve for private circulation only. That was to get around any obscenity, try to get around obscenity laws. Um, so yeah, we the, the whole text of Eve's lesbian love is reprinted as, as an appendix to her biography. And we even, I insisted to the publisher that they copy every typo because the typos are wonderful. They show that nobody uh, edited Eve's book for her and it represents her vo authentic voice. So I love that, all the, the little mistakes in the typos. And the illustrations as well. Yeah, the uh, four illustrations um, are of women with women in some degree of undress and sometimes naked, but there's nothing. I was told that these pictures like these appeared in perfectly uh, okay books of 1925. And uh, they were later called obscene in, they were out to get Eve, so they called them obscene, but. Um, it's all pretty tame. Yeah, it's pretty tame, even, even for 1925, yeah. Uh, there's a question from Carrie. Can you talk about the place of bisexuality in interwar lesbian gay scenes? How many women termed lesbians also had relationships with men? And did Adam's lesbian love include those women? Now, that is an interesting question I haven't gotten before. Eve, uh, perhaps there's some indication. Uh, ben Reitman says that she had an abortion. So uh, she went out with some guy uh, it, and um, uh, that's, we don't know who uh, maybe future research will tell because maybe that guy wrote something about their relationship or a letter or something that would be wonderful to find. I'm hoping that the publication of the book will lead to more uh, findings of a few more wonderful documents. So yeah, the advice. So I guess Eve herself experimented with heterosexual uh, relationships. Uh, I don't know how many, um, but um, she seems to have then found a more satisfaction with uh, in in with in her relationships with women. Uh, it's clear from a letter that she wrote 
to Ruth Norlander that I discuss in the biography that she was deeply in love with Ruth and uh, there and liked their relationship. I, it's not clear why they broke up actually. I think it was Ruth probably who initiated that. There's some indication in the documents that that's the case. Uh, there's a question from Freddie. What is now in the basement of 129 McDougal? Well, above, it's the sort of the basement of La Tab, La Tab, I'm forgetting the name. It's a, a re Italian restaurant on 129 McDougal Street. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, it's just, I'm forgetting. So it's a restaurant. Yeah. So uh, you can go there to the restaurant, you know, have a, a drink of coffee or of uh, other kinds and get a pizza or whatever. And you can go down in the basement and look around. And it's remarkable that a hundred years later, it looks pretty much like you get the sense that of what it looked like in Eve's time, even though some things have changed. It's dark and um, there's a fireplace with uh, pewter things on it that happened to be like what was existed in Eve's time. Um, I, I advise going there and, and checking it out. They should put a plaque. Yeah, the owner uh, of the restaurant is uh, really gung ho on will be, I hope he'll, I think he said he'd like to sell copies of the Eve's biography. He loves the idea and he's heard all about it. Great. Um, Jean is asking about her political relations with Emma Goldman. Yes, um, it's interesting. She apparently Eve started working at the Mother o uh, Mother Earth office that uh, is soon soon after she arrived. I, I it seems and. Um, she would have met Goldman there. This was Mother Earth was the uh, anarchist journal that Emma founded with Alexander Berkman, the, who had tried to kill Frick and went to jail for 14 years for it. So he was really notorious and Emma was too. Um, it's interesting that even though Eve worked closely with these uh, anarchist figures and got to you know, love them, um, very fond of them, and uh, visited them after they were all uh, deported. Um, she she uh, really um, differed from Emma Goldman. Uh, Eve maintained a belief in a, uh, uh, she, uh, a, uh, a creator, a religious belief that Emma Goldman uh, did not. She was a militant atheist. And so it's interesting that their views differed so much on, for instance, on that subject. And um, um, yeah, so that was a, a nice thing to find that you could differ with Emma and still be a, 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 an associate of her. Um, Jan is asking if you could say more about the surveillance files you read for this project and did they lead to bureau harassment and prosecutions? Uh, yes, they're fascinating. And I have put them online on outhistory.org, uh, Eve Adams documents. And um, I quote a lot from them in the book, um, and they were uh, they were a major source, I believe. It's not quite documented how the immigration authorities and the ju the uh, justice department's uh, interest in Eve finally was associated with the New York City police sending in a policewoman to investigate Eve, why that happened. But clearly there's some connection, I think, between Washington and New York City. Um, I suggest more details about that in the book itself. And maybe more will be documented later. Um, Morgan is looking forward to reading your book and says anything else on the horizon? Oh. 
maybe a memoir. I don't know. I grew up in Greenwich Village, mm -hmm. went by 129 McDougal Street many, many, many times and never knew the fascinating place that it happened in the basement. Um, yeah, I, I don't know yet uh, what I, what I'm, I'm working hard on outhistory.org, the major website on US LGBT history that includes amazing discoveries that are nowhere else uh, talked about. Um, so I advise uh, readers to, uh, users uh, to uh, look at it and see, see, look it over. Okay. Um, Isabel is suggesting that the restaurant could be La Tavola, the one on McDougal. La, La Taverna. La Taverna. Yes. Okay. Um, and we'll finish with this question from Sherry. Has anyone submitted a page of testimony to Yad Vashem for Eve? And if not, would you consider doing it? Um, it's, it's there. Yes, it is there. It was submitted by Eve's uh, brother, Eve's brother, Yerak Mil years ago. Um, so, uh, yes, it was by the Eve's brother, or was it by Echon? I forget, uh, but it's there. It's been done. Yeah. Okay, Be before we finish up, I just want to, we want to put a quick uh, link in the chat because your feedback helps us plan future events. So if you could fill out a very short survey, um, we would appreciate it. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's talk and especially thank you to Jonathan. And I recommend that you purchase and read the book. So thanks everybody, have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.